but in sense of direction. After reaching these, long, these unmarked graves, the names of the cafes become long forgotten. Forgetting begins to displace commemoration, thereby decentering and destabilizing the self. Before we know it, we are no longer following a map. Rather, we are lost in a maze. Paris, Benjamin continues, taught him the art of straying that had shown its first traces, and I'm quoting him, shown its first traces in the labyrinths on the blotting pages of my school exercise books. Berlin, a city of maternal burdens, nursemaids, governesses, mama herself, offered him erring paths, though that's his term, paths on which prostitutes crossed, thereby sending a thrill of dépaysement and transgression into the spinal cord of his bourgeois class origins. Paris again seduced him not into an orgy of remembrance, but rather into an epiphany of forgetting, a vision of, quote, so many entrances into the maze. And this is another quote recalling Sartre's cafe. It's the same one. Um, now on the afternoon in question, I was sitting inside the Café de Magot at Saint-Germain-des-Prés, where I was waiting. I forget for whom. So he becomes Pierre in that sense. Suddenly, and with compelling force, I was struck by the idea of drawing a diagram of my life and knew at the very moment exactly how it was to be done. With a very simple question, I interrogated my past life, and the answers were inscribed, as if of their own accord, on a sheet of paper that I had with me. A year or two later, when I lost this sheet, I was inconsolable. I have never since been able to restore it as it arose before me then, resembling a series of family trees. Now, however, reconstructing its outline in thought without directly reproducing it, I should rather speak of a labyrinth. For Benjamin, the city is a lost text of the self, replaced by a mnemonic trope, the labyrinth, which itself turns, or rather veers, from truth to error, much like the famous deconstructive turn. And there's a book on deconstruction called The Deconstructive Turn. According to Paul Dumont's reading of rhetoric, tropes are always already turns, from tropus, as Anne mentioned, meaning turn, manière, from tropisme, the most primitive form of plant life turning towards the sun, and aux enfants, Le Corbusier evoked that as well. Figuration itself is a process whereby language disguises the original error on which all systems of signification are founded. Taking his cue from Nietzsche's famous argument that, quote, truths are illusions whose illusionary nature has been forgotten, metaphors that have been used up and have lost their imprint, and that now operate as mere metal, no longer as coins, Paul Dumont elaborates a theory of semantic speculation, a term I am using in the sense of market risks on valued property, specularity, or the consciousness of mirrors, doubles, and false copies, and the process of self-deceptive thought. Glossing Nietzsche, Dumont affirms that, quote, what is being forgotten in this false literalism is precisely the rhetorical symbolic quality of all language. The degradation of metaphor into literal meaning is not condemned because, because it is the forgetting of a truth, but much rather because it forgets the untruth, the lie that the metaphor was in the first place. Paul Dumont assigned an active role to forgetting within his own Allegories of Reading, that's the name of his most famous book, which perhaps accounts, at least in part, for why his early and unacknowledged writings in a Nazi-supported newspaper are causing him so much posthumous trouble. Interpretation, and I quote from him again, interpretation is nothing but the possibility of error, he wrote in Blindness and Insight. In selecting citations from Rousseau, he was attracted like a magnet to syllogisms of duplicity, as in the phrases, I love truth, I search for it, but fail to recognize it. Or, I have found there to be actual instances in which truth can be withheld without injustice and disguised without lying. In discussing Proust's comparison between the family maid, Françoise, and the kitchen maid within the household of childhood, Demont pointed inevitably, and this is in, in Proust, Dumont pointed inevitably to the fact that, quote, the kitchen maid is only a pale reflection of Francoise. In substituting for truth, error degrades and outwears it, causing a sequence of lapses that threatens to contaminate the entire section. <laughs> 
Now, what is Dumont's tropology of forgetting to do with Benjamin's forgotten city of the self? On one level, it suggests that psychoanalytically speaking, there is no innocent memory lapse. Though Dumont now stands accused of a compromising past that he had good reason to want to disguise, whereas Benjamin's tragic suicide during his flight from the Nazis argues, if anything, for a monument to remembering. Both were caught up in the drama of deciphering how monuments, whether philosophical bulwarks or edifices in stone, mark the wrong place. That is, the spots where original error is forgotten. Benjamin's map, like Dumont's, is composed of wrong way streets, erring paths and blind alleys, leading to masks or covers for mistaken identities and fruitless searching. Those are all his terms. Mistaken identities are clearly evoked in the ghostly personages of Benjamin's friend, the poet activist, Fritz Heinle, and Benjamin's fiancée, Julia Cohn, recipient of a lost ring. What Benjamin says of Heinle is consummately self-forgetting. And then he says, this is a long passage, it was in Heidelberg, during what was undoubtedly self-forgetful work, that I tried to summon up, in a meditation on the nature of the lyric, the figure of my friend Fritz Heinle, around whom all the happenings in the meeting house arrange themselves, and with whom they vanish. Fritz Heinle was a poet, and the only one of them all whom I met, not in real life, but in his work. He died at 19 and could be known in no other way. Heinle's Berlin was the Berlin of the meeting house. He lived at this period in closest proximity to it, in a fourth floor room on Klopstockstrasse. Klopstock, the poet. Klopstockstrasse. I once visited him there. It was after a long separation resulting from a serious dissension between us, but even today I remember the smile that lifted the whole weight of these weeks of separation that turned a probably insignificant phrase into a magic formula that healed the wound. Later, after the morning when an express letter awoke me with the words, you will find us lying in the meeting house, when Heinle and his girlfriend were dead, this district remained for a period the central place of the living. What is even more striking than the bizarre temporality shifts of this passage, undercutting any fixed historical vantage point or ideological position from which the anecdote is recounted, is the fact that Benjamin, as narrator, forgets, as he describes his visit to the living Heinle, that earlier in the story he claims never to have met him in real life. Is this passage the counterfeit memorial to a man who only existed for Benjamin, quote, in his work, or genuine homage to a flesh and blood friend. What happened to Heinle? Was he really killed, or was his death simulated, staged, or put on, a, put on as a way of signaling the end of his influence on the narrator? Benjamin's heart-rending prosopoeia, an elegiacal apostrophe, a way of um, a trope of making the dead one speak. This prosopoeia popeia founders in a web of indeterminacies that makes us query his own motives for telling the story in the first place. A similarly vexed set of questions are posed in the mysterious anecdote of the four rings, which he calls the keys to his city, the city of the self. He, and he says, there were, if I'm not mistaken, three of us, my friend, his fiance at that time, or Frau Dorothea J and me. C asked to see rings, Greek and Renaissance cameos, rings from the imperial period, usually work carved in semi-precious stone. Each of the four that he finally purchased is imprinted unforgettably on my mind. Here the opening, if I am not mistaken, creates a percussive sound in the closing, imprinted unforgettably on, a, on my mind. What is unforgettable turns out to be what is forgotten, namely, the fourth person, the destinataire of the third ring, Benjamin's then fiancée, Greta Roth. In a devious turn, Benjamin effaces Greta, casually noting as if in passing, sh quote, shortly after giving it the ring away, I broke off my relationship with its new owner. My heart had already gone with the last of the four rings, which the giver had reserved for his sister. And certainly this girl was the true center of the circle's fate, though years were to elapse before we realized it. In recentering his affection on another girl, Benjamin decenters the identity of the recipient of the fourth ring, forgetting, as an active verb, who she is in a maze of quasi-incestuous elective affinities, 
And this is a quote, this is absolutely. He says, the fate by virtue of which she, who stood in relation to her brother, that by its tenderness filled to the very edge the limits of sisterly love, was to form a liaison with her brother's two closest friends, with the recipient of the ring with the head of Pompeii, and with me, to find her husband finally in the brother of the woman who married her own brother as her second husband, and she it was, on the day I am speaking of, who received from me the ring with the Medusa's head. If anyone here can tell me who she is, I would be grateful. As if to make matters worse, the text of a sonnet sent by Benjamin to the recipient of the ring is broken off in mid-sentence, quote, to your finger constantly encircled. The circular pattern of truth and error, their ability, as Demont says, to exist simultaneously, thus preventing the favoring of the one over the other, spirals into a textual gap which itself blanks out or papers over the white lies and original untruths that were there in the first place. Suburban monuments indulge in similar dodges and disguises. For example, we can read as so many tropes of error, urban, urban signifiers such as city center, the center has become the margin, nor did it ever exist, senior citizen's home, it represents the grotesque double of a real home, itself already ersatz. Supermarket, now ironically read as a pun on stock market. Traffic artery, already clogged and clotted. Art museum, where the whole notion of art is outside the space in which it is enclosed. Or finally, Bitburg Cemetery, the place chosen by Ronald Reagan to forget the Holocaust as he overlooked the graves of SS officers. If we were to look for an analog to the sensibility of forgetting in the postmodern city, we would have to admit that the past is never finally dead and buried as such, ready to be revealed by the apparently precise methods of the historian. Neither monuments nor memories are so easily forgotten. However, the procedure of difficult disinterment that Benjamin recommends as a way of seeking our own buried past demands recognition of the chain of errors and willful forgettings involved in the monu monumentalization of memory in the city. According to Benjamin, we should never dig where results are most expected, but rather, quote, not be afraid to return again and again to the same matter, to scatter it as one scatters earth, to turn it over as one turns over soil. For the matter itself is only a deposit, a stratum, which yields only to the most meticulous examination what constitutes the real treasure hidden within the earth, the images severed from all earlier associations that stand like precious fragments of torsos in a collector's gallery in the prosaic rooms of our later understanding." End of quote. Benjamin tells us that the real treasures are no more than severed images, dislocated and disembodied from structural form. Disinterment, then, is like a wrong way street leading only to the quintessential non-monument, the banal, unnoticed, prosaic room of speculation. Thank you. I've always planned to be very brief, and that's what I shall be. Since I'm so far away from the classroom, I'm afraid I'm turning more and more into a schoolmaster. And uh, I planned to take some of the points that I discussed in my lectures and seminars with you before, and as it were, inject them and connect them uh, to this larger setting of our discussions. First, I would like to uh, declare that the city is not a text. I'd like to resist the tendency to universalize everything via its absorption into a coded system of signs. There is, I propose, both a realm of life practice and a realm of mute things that resist this universalization and that resist this absorption into text and language. Do I have the first two slides, please? It is a happy coincidence that the name and the object 
and the practice of the map and of mapping have been mentioned several times. Indeed, one form of recording of urban reality at any moment is the map. But what that map records, excludes, destroys, transforms, disfigures, permutates, must be held firmly against the notion of the map, as it were, of the precise, ultimate, abstracted, and coherent fixation of what is mapped. And I therefore put side by side that map of a portion of Berlin within which Schinkel, among others, has been particularly active during his lifetime, and contrast it with a kind of maze map uh, to refer back to the Benjaminian notion of uh, that machine representing both the plan and the contents, the survival and the destruction of the city of Palmanova in Daniel Libeskind's machines built for uh, the Biennale. Now, if the map is a vessel of recording, then there are, if it's a form of a record, then there are formats of viewing and imagining. Can I have the next ones, please? And of course, this viewing that is not coincident with the recording of a view, or the painting and representation of views, but the viewing itself is, a, is a, a, a way of going from elements which have no place seemingly on the map to places which can be firmly attributed and described into the map, just as taking points of departure in the map will lead one away from it and compose, as it were, views. Now, next ones, please. The viewing itself, however, requires a kind of minimum apparatus. And the practice of viewing, therefore, can be at once a highly controlled and contrived and indeed a simulated one, as if the process could reach its own a sense of itself only under conditions which are now fully determined by the apparatus and the insinuation of a viewing rather than simply applied anywhere at any one moment. Or it can merely be the slightest indication that indeed a view could be thought to result from this activity by providing a minimum definition of a frame, so to speak, a railing, a foreground, a balcony, a dark vertical which might frame or divide a particular segment of the view. And you recall that we discussed, those of you who, who were there, uh, it, that we discussed a, a particular highly contrived apparatus created for the exercise, in fact, one could say, for the deliberate learning of this viewing activity in the panorama uh, section on the left, uh, and how surprisingly constant, long beyond its technical uh, lifetime, so to speak, uh, long beyond its historical or technical or even illusionistic justification, the notion of the panorama persists as it reappears significantly in uh, the presentation of Corbusier's uh, project of the city of the future uh, in 1925 on your right-hand side. Now, between the view and the viewer, between the map and the maze, uh, there are all those connecting activities that are physical as opposed to, let's say, the mere decipherment of a text as one quietly sits in a chair and looks at the same piece of paper. We have instead walking. Sometimes you can, the eyes or the fingers do the walking, but uh, walking, that is to say, uh, a movement from one point to another or to many points, 
uh, might extend into driving from one point to another. It might even include such things as flying from one point to the other. And the representation uh, symbolically of walking, of driving, uh, of flying, uh, ha have pro provided uh, certainly in the last 150 years more than merely ornamental uh, ciphers on the, in the representation of views. What then gives the viewer through a recognition of viewers as a recognition of their points of view, in the end a view has been the subject next to please of some of the things we have discussed in greater detail and I recall only two here and that is on the right hand side of course that extraordinary vestibule constructed uh, inside the museum where even the arrangement of the stairs projects the visitor back out towards the city rather than actually drawing or leading viewers and visitors into the museum itself, making the museum to a startling extent a kind of viewing apparatus for the city and providing within that viewing apparatus something of a simulated ambulation, some of that rising and falling over stairs, the walking through passages that obscure view into plat to platforms and viewing stands that offer a view, uh, etc., through a kind of simulated urban experience that itself becomes as much a, an apparatus um, by which we can deal with the city as the museum itself is a cultural apparatus by which we deal both with the past and the present and of course with the future. So there is between viewer, viewpoint apparatus, the view that is yielded and the simulation of this process a rapport that plays back into the map and that in a sense uh, offers the, op the opportunity to arrive at a state where that map, instead of being fixed on a piece of paper, instead of being the height of abstraction, is re-immersed, as it were, into the activity of viewing and thereby ceases to be an abstract map, but becomes a kind of mental tracing um, of that mode of entering, exiting, and passing of that mode of experiencing the modern city. Can I have the next ones, please? There is, of course, a, a very strong tension uh, between the distractions which are offered everywhere and the high form of attention that has to be paid uh, from any of these defined viewing stands. Be there, is a, there is a kind of focus uh, a need to focus and a need to flow out of the focus. Um, I I all of these as part of that viewing which becomes the experiencing of the place. Closely linked to actual physical motion, uh, as I said, it, it's not a book, uh, the, in this constant zoom from one focus to another, the loss of grasp visually or by orientation and the regaining of a foothold of a perch of a point of reference uh, is intrinsic to the particular conditions that urban the urban experience reconstitutes in the early 19th century and in fact becomes at that point definitely explicitly literally theoretically and experientially identified with that particular mode of behavior. And of course, the close connection between a bodily movement, between the stance, the perch, the position, and the activity of viewing uh, uh, needs no greater emphasis. I would like here to only put, again, symbolically recalling 
some of the things we have discussed, two images side by side. Uh, and of course, one is uh, the view of the proscenium curtain inside Chinkelsohn Theatre, representing that theatre from an idealized remote, remote point of view, which coincides with the actual symbolic residence of the viewer as calculated in this representation, namely from the royal box, the king himself seeing his own theatre. Uh, therefore, in a sense, the ultimate transposition of all of these rapports into terms that, are, that bespeak the relationship of a one viewer to whatever is seen, and on the opposite side, the almost undecided, com complement complementary side of that huge boulder from uh, the second latest glaciation of the northern European plains left behind uh, by glaciers that carried it from Scandinavia, polished the coarseness of matter itself, the material of construction and compression with extraordinarily contrived and highly sophisticated modern machinery ground to a mirror polish and erected like one of those uh, um, bold as were as they rode on those cones of ice on the backs of glaciers now sitting on a central pylon in the midst of the city and not looking like something left behind from Aboriginal origins, but now something raised to perform, to form a kind of mirror uh, of the city itself, a mirror which refracts and disperses everything that is reflected on its curvi curving surface, while that point and that object focus everything uh, in, the, in the city. And uh, as I explained historically, this enormous granite basin initially expected by Schinkel to be placed inside the central rotunda of the museum, making an almost nonsensical duplication that inside the central pantheon of this entire culture, there should be refined in its appearance a coarse reminder of geological origins placed under the dome of the museum, now moved outside to form a kind of navel or umbilicus, the, the center of the city uh, from which everything would be seen. And here is, in fact, seen, in a sense, in refraction um, on the curvilinear surface. It is, uh, if you want, the complete reversal of all the terms of the panorama, where instead of the viewer from a privileged, unique position embracing in one 360-degree sweep in a comprehensive synthetic image the entire city and its history, it is from one central 360-degree round polished surface that the city is refracted back upon to itself and thereby in an extraordinarily fascinating way at one and the same moment we have both arrived at the ultimate summation of a concept easily several thousand years in the making and at that moment we have arrived at the point of the destruction and refraction of that motion, notion as it were from the same point of view. Now um, the tendency of fixation then produce, produces less a text less a summary, so to speak, than a tableau. A tableau, which is always something that uh, has a certain affinity to theatrical representation. It's a kind of symbolic analog of that dispersal which happens. Just indeed, it happens in the theater. One of the extraordinary ways why in the history of theater, from the very first stages, and you all know the famous stage sets codified in the early 16th century, and providing a generic cityscape or a cityscape divided according to the class, the classes, so where tragedies, events happening in the noble houses, events determining the fate of the world are set against the background of grand palatial residences, according to Serlio, and he explains quite literally and in rather amusing terms uh, how the grand events of history and the bloody events that properly take place in the houses of kings and nobles, etc., require that background, as opposed to the jumble of houses of all styles, all manner and kind, forming the right background to the comedy which is taking place uh, in the, in the um, 
uh, in the realm of commerce, where in the modern city everything is reduced to transactions among incongruous correspondences and, and incom people of incongruous relationships and, and, and standings and so forth. So this tableau of the theater here merely brings home a history of several hundred years in which, uh, of course, the actors themselves are in a sense no more than the symbolic representatives of the viewers themselves inside the tableau. Whereas the monument, of course, is the ultimate reduction of all of that, the shrinking of all of these relationships to one point where in the end a single column, a single inscription, a single object can play that uh, um, uh, uh, role of the of, of, of the marker uh, that moved from the mark is at least potentially and usually in reality um, uh, 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 destroyed or remo removed from its capacity uh, uh, to, to mimic and to show. Uh, I'd like to carry this uh, forward to something which uh, uh, um, is not built. Uh, it is the Berlin Project which won a first prize uh, uh, by Daniel Liebeskind. Uh, in which this notion of the text, the notion of the unique viewing apparatus from which to understand the experience of the city, which is also a point from which to understand its past and its future, are given, in my view, an extraordinary, singularly compelling articulation. Uh, not uh, accidentally, and I hope you can see this if the light came down a little bit, at least uh, if you see it reproduced, you would realize that uh, the existing ground of the city on the left-hand side, uh, over which seemed to rise this absolutely extraordinary uh, uh, structure, uh, is appropriately covered with scraps of texts that, like in a chiri collage um, uh, object, cover the entire surface. In other words, the fragmented cityscape is indeed a text. It is a kind of semantic confetti landscape, the ultimate alphabet soup in which everything has been, has been uh, boiled down uh, to the sticky stuff which will line any object and any surface. In other words, the modern city has a kind of ultimate sticky stuff uh, uh, that uh, forms this, this meaningless, constant noise of highly specific meanings, like so many uh, books torn to bits, uh, littering uh, the setting. While the projected, the imagined, the future object is in fact like a gigantic titanic sinking into the semantic sea of the city of the past and the present. Thanks. I can uh, ask our speakers to join us on the podium and uh, perhaps we can have some discussion. I don't think, what's that? Uh, is there, are there more glasses somewhere like, to be had for our poor, right starving speakers? Right on the huh. I mean, what's a bottle of water with no glass? My goodness, I didn't know they exported Henier, Swiss. This, this is probably an attempt to bias this discussion towards one nationality, towards Berlin rather than Paris, to the place of uh, remembering rather than the place of forgetting the map rather than the maze, all of that in the bottle. Um, I don't think we really need to uh, stoke the fires any further. There seems to be a series of fairly clear distinctions. Uh, is the city a text or isn't it? 
is the figure a ground, is the city a ground, or is it a clear uh, and very highly coded memory? Uh, and uh, finally, uh, should one look for a disembodied, uh, disarticulated uh, cover for the hidden treasures uh, which might help us remember or of memory itself? Or must we instead find the single stone uh, somewhere in the dark forest of an obliterating architecture to remind us of what we are trying to forget? Um, I don't know which one of you would like to, uh, to choose sides first. But uh, perhaps, uh, Kurt, could you comment directly on uh, Tony's proposal for a city as ground? I, know, I knew there was a cafe society, but I'm not sure that there is a cafe city. Um, I think the cafe, in its, uh, certainly in its French edition, as opposed to its Austrian edition, for instance, which was the one invoked in Handke, um, represents a very peculiar locus within which to uh, examine uh, the, the condition uh, of an individual in a society and the condition of a particular moment um, experiencing uh, both, in a sense, the overbrimming presence of, uh, of, uh, of um, reality around the person and then the curious the vacuity um, that opens up uh, within it. Cafes are indispensable to the, were indispensable to the life of, of, of Paris. Um, how central they are to uh, the understanding of the transformations of the modern city, particularly in their French theoretical articulation, perhaps, rather than in their realization there, in, in, the, in the modernism, that I'm... Uh, I'm, I'm doubtful. I mean, I mean, I was, it's, it's genuine doubt. I, mean, I just don't know. I can't, I can't uh, give an instant uh, res response to it. Um, it, it modern, modernism as the uh, phantom Pierre um, is, is also perhaps passing a little bit quickly over the fact that this Pierre wasn't just uh, expected by one person, and it was not simply going to, he was not simply going to um, uh, fill a predictable uh, vacancy, as it were, uh, held in the expectancy of his friend waiting. In fact, there were very few people waiting. Uh, this guy elbowed its way into the cafe and into the city in ways that have always been considered to be particularly ob perhaps oblivious, and in that sense uh, the connection is, is, is evident, uh, ob oblivious to, um, to that general condition. Therefore downgrading it as it were, making it a mere background, a mere, uh, a mere backdrop. Uh, to the grand and brutal stance uh, that this unwelcome and largely unexpected friend um, would take in that, in that setting. But also, was he ever quite there in that way, and did he go away? Uh, that, that would be my question. Uh, uh, what happened? Uh, is this a simple reversal? Are we back to, uh, in a sense, uh, not missing his absence and foregrounding again uh, what uh, he would have brutally put uh, behind his shoulders? Or where are we with him? Oh, I think he's gone to ground. <laughs> um, I agree. The cafe but have you <laughs> driven down Wiltshire <laughs> Boulevard? Well, he wasn't there this afternoon. Um, the cafe, of course, was only an analog. It was not like a diorama. It was as essential or inessential to a particular condition of urbanism. Um, it was, of course, an analog. My, my sense of 
of uh, of the condition of going to ground, I guess, is to do with the the possibility of a continuous fluctuation, but I guess, between figure and ground, which is presented to us. Um, and I said this last night at USC that by the peculiar fascination that Benjamin himself has with the arcade, where the arcade can neither be a, uh, a monument or a building type, uh, it is always a passage, it is always a work which is in the process of being formed and made, and at the same time it's a phantom which leads to utopias about itself, which in the end uh, produces architectures out of itself, which are idealizations of something that can never mm -hmm. be yeah, and, and, and we, Which are so the reversal in that, that yes. they exist now all by themselves out yes. in the countryside, as it yes. were, in a reincarnation uh, that uh, seems to refuse any uh, deductive explanations of its historic origin. Yeah, so, yeah. precisely. And I, and, and I was simply proposing that, that maybe um, the, the sensibility that, that would allow us to be um, um, a kind of rag picker of history as opposed to a monument maker of history uh, would allow us to see a simultaneously um, ground, figure and ground condition of more than simply the original um, architectonic markers of a, of a city that is always ground in front of the memorial. Um, but a city which consistently becomes a memorial of itself in several fluctuating and different cases. In the sense the, the, that that, uh, that moment between the diorama and the movie, uh, which is, uh, um, what is it, the bioscope or the kinetoscope, mm -hmm. where the images flicker yes. um, between, uh, between being uh, fully formed and, and transformed. And, and, I, and I, yeah. I, that was simply my... Perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps either, uh, perhaps Anne, would you uh, like to respond to uh, Kurt's statement that the city is not a text? You seem to regard it as a text. <laughs> I need two, mi often <laughs> two microphones to respond to that. I think I do need two microphones to respond to that because what I'm trying to to talk about is a kind of, we, we were in danger of three of us all quoting from the same chapter of Allegories of Reading tonight, since um, I was really thinking in my failed attempt to stick to 20 minutes of um, the quote from Daman where he speaks about uh, the, 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 the infinite suspension between the self and the death of the self in the figural and the, and the grounded, perhaps. And what I, the, the model or um, uh, philosophical assumption that I'm bringing to the situation is one of not having to choose. And I was wondering, in fact, with regard to that, um, and in fact, not, not only not having to choose so as to put one definitely inside and one definitely outside, but rather what I need help with in what I find helpful in um, the Demonian and um, other uh, post-structuralist models is a, um, a way of conceiving the interrelationship between these two forces, what kind of, of, of um, process they, they undergo. And for early Greek thought, which I work on, which definitely thinks in, in, in oppositions like figure and ground, text and not text and so forth, what I've seen over and over again is not a situation where something is stably in and stably out. That, and I wondered, um, but, but that's indeed working on texts. Uh, I'm working on, so that I'm very open to being, um, educated and enlightened as to how these things are different. There was one phrase, though, that you used which could maybe help me see this. I thought at a certain point you spoke of a mental tracing as being the result of, of the process you were describing. And I wondered if that was an instance of needing the phenomenon of the trace 
to define the non-textuality of the building, and that you needed it in the form of a metaphor to describe how, in fact, the building was not metaphorical. And um, so I don't want to say a building is just a, a text at all. In fact, the uncanny quality of the buildings that I was looking at uh, seemed to me to derive from the fact of there being such signal instances of the, um, for lack of a better word, and I really needed one, uh, indecidability of this distinction between uh, expression, representation, form, and text. Uh, so really, this is a sincere attempt to be uh, illuminated on this. I have only a flashlight. I uh, don't know how much uh, it will do. But uh, um, I think uh, it's absolutely indispensable, in my view, to recognize the extraordinary physicality of, and I don't mean thereby, you know, what usually architects call physicality or texture, or it's a body, it's something, it's there, etc. It's all those things, but more than that, a, a f the fundamental belonging of objects in a city to the dumb world, the non-speaking world of things. And therefore, the continuous, equally powerful need to somehow attribute things to them and make sense of them in terms which allow for instant transposition, precisely the sort of transposition that the physical world does not does not allow, as it were. You can you can race down the page, but you can't race ten blocks down the street, you know, in in anything resembling the same manner. Uh, so this the the the. The physical world uh, uh, it can be understood, must be understood, if it's not simply transfigured instantly into another realm, namely the realm of textual or graphic uh, uh, referential connections. It must be recognized for what it is, and therefore it gives in, in its essential experiential dimensions of of viewing, of seeing it less clearly at some point, much more clearly, of having to go and walk a stretch, to change your position, uh, to define uh, and, and retain clearly at any one moment, if you wish, to clarify this in mind where you see it from uh, and, and so forth. In other words, all definitions reacquire, even in their abstractions, uh, a content of this physicality. If that is part, if that's an irreducible part, of the city, then uh, I think one is likely to, uh, to approach it, uh, describe it, and analyze it differently from the way one would approach and describe and analyze it if one had already completely transposed that or substituted for that reality uh, one of uh, total semantic and referential mastery and control. You know, this, this very debate in a certain form uh, took place in the recent um, meetings of the ACSA uh, in, in Miami uh, between uh, uh, Jeff Kipnis and Mark Wigley, again, over whether the building is or is, is not available to this kind of, of Oh, it is available, of course. Anything and, is available to linguistic operations, right? But uh, well, the point that was stressed there was the the degree to which, w when somebody like me, anyway, says text, we're not making um, an assimilation to language. It, textual and linguistic are not necessarily the same, and that um, from the point of view that we're working, it really is not is not the, the case, that what we're doing is simply applying uh, language to this physical thing and making the mute stone speak as a result. It's, it's, that's not the assumption. So I'm not clear yet on why the building is not a text. Uh, maybe I will apologize for bringing uh, the word text even into this debate. Uh, perhaps we can concentrate more on, uh, on whether buildings lie or not, which seems to be at issue in all four of your talks. Um, I, I would, Emily, perhaps you can comment on um, whether or not the mute presences, which uh, Kurt has, has called up onto this table, uh, not, do not lie by not speaking or by not being uh, critically remembered. Well, first I'd just say, as, as far as the text issue goes, that 
Um, what we're talking, I think we're talking about more is not text but tropes that is describing how, just precisely those operations of how you see, um, which do condition how you would textualize a building. And there's been a lot of fuss about materiality versus immateriality, that buildings can't be text. And I don't think literary critics want to say that buildings are texts. Um, or deconstructors, that they have any parti pris in saying that, but it's more that, that the perception of buildings can operate like erroneous, um, can operate like tropes, and that it's the workings of tropes that we're, we're talking about, in a sense, more than any kind of fixed sense of text. But I would throw a question out to the audience as far as what the architectural equivalent of errors would be. I mean, I, you, it's almost like uh, refried beans or double, uh, double cooked pork, you know, if there's something doubled going on, there's a, f a willful forgetting, how, do you, would you, how would you build the forgotten, the, the willfully forgotten building? I mean, there's something of, of speculation, of simulation, of simulacrum there. Um, I was thinking there's a, they're building a Disneyland, um, which will be a replica of Paris, right near Paris. It's right in the section of Paris, which is the banlieue, where a lot of um, Marne la Vallée, where all this urban, re um, it's sort of a ghetto, basically. But and the question is, why would you reconstruct in this Disneyland a replica of Paris? What interests me isn't just that it's a replica; it's that it's so close to the real Paris. There's something going on that you're supposed to forget the real Paris by going to this thing that is right next to the real Paris and somehow assimilate the one by forgetting the other. I mean, that was sort of the closest I could come to some sort of architectural example. It's not just a, a simulation, but a simulation in, in violent relation, in some sort of violent suppressive relation to an erroneous original, and that's... A well, and you seem to be implying that even if that were the case, that we could, in seeing the relationship between Paris and its ersatz uh, or remade version, uh, we could remember because it is, in fact, impossible in architecture to completely erase or to completely simulate. And that in those fissures which you see all around you in Venice, uh, memory does appear. Perhaps not in conscious architecture, although you were implying that your own house captured that. <laughs> Isn't this wonderful? <laughs> Error seems to be in relation to an origin point. And uh, if that origin point is in motion, the process of error yeah. itself is in motion. <laughs> and I was thinking of seodea homoea tumoisin, false things like to, tr to the real things in your false Paris just next to it. And from in the, in the, in the so-called speech or the utterance, the rhetoric, I'll really much prefer that, of the muses, the problem will just be that the distinction between error and not error is, is, is a problematical one just because the point of reference is, is shifting all the time. And so uh, I don't know if that gets at what you're, what you're saying, but it, it isn't that I'm saying one could always uncover and unmask an error, but that um, there are these instances in which the distinction between error and truth or, or uh, ground and figure or the real thing and its imitation is because of its tropic uh, rhetorical character, uh, not one that you can make and, and, and have stay put. It, will st it is subject to uh, the female function, uh, <laughs> the, the female movability. There are other possible relationships that come into play here, not just error, a truth. Think of the fact that the panoramas, when they were first created, what did they show in their majority? How could you make people in Paris pay to take a look at Paris inside the panorama, when supposedly in, 19, in 1800 it was just as much around as it, as it is today? Uh, and that the relationship is one rather of turning certain characteristics which belong to the new observation or viewing of the city, for instance, combining uh, an unprecedented degree of accuracy which belongs generally to a disposition 
uh, that spreads very, very quickly into very different areas of life, that you're absolutely precise and accurate in what you render, but then you re or, or observe or note, but then when you render something like a view of Paris, very accurately using the latest optical uh, scientific uh, means to do so, you create an instance of unprecedented and total illusion. That is to say, you're completely fooled by what is absolutely correct. Uh, and that is part of, this of the extraordinary larger implications of the phenomenon of the panorama. And so I do not really, in a sense, to push the terms, I, do, I, have, I don't know the details of this uh, Disney operation from which obviously but nobody is going to escape. Uh, but uh, uh, I would, I'm, from what I can imagine it might be, it is not an ersatz Paris, it's going to be nothing like Paris. Uh, and within which conditions will obtain which have never been achieved in Paris itself, I'm quite sure. So that, in fact, of being, instead of being an ersatz or a wrong Paris, or they didn't quite get it Paris to do it, they are doing a completely different Paris, which presumably contains some elements, physical or otherwise, which make it a recognizable other version, uh, but not not something which by its existence is merely duplicating or is merely denying uh, the, or substituting for the thing that is there already. It will presumably contain a whole street of cafes. Um, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. With a whole um, army of absent but, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, yeah. I did want to ask Kurt one, one thing because I, maybe I wasn't paying attention towards the end of your, your talk but there was a moment um, between your assertion of the absolute um, primacy of uh, of visual and and uh, and and of, of vision and movement, visual and locomotive uh, ways of understanding the city, um, shifting from that to your um, analysis of the Liebeskind plan for for Berlin, where um, it suddenly seemed that Berlin, by virtue of the Liebeskind transposition, because of the collaging of 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 of, of, of of texts um, on the city. You actually said here the city has become a text and here um, laid into that text is a, uh, is a bar which is both the wall and not the wall and so on. And I wonder what that had to, how, how what the status of the Liebeskind project was in relationship to your assertion of the primacy of, of, of the visual and the locomotive. That is, yeah. is, is the Liebeskind project criticizing the idea of the city as text, or is it supporting um, your uh, the notion of a city become text is not a city, or is it um, at odds with you in, 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 in fact, proposing a city which is a text and cannot be, uh, which cannot be understood except through a kind of mapping device? Well, uh, it, can, it can be presumably a number of these things and maybe even more. And I had no uh, intention to uh, reduce it simply or exhaust it in, in any one single fashion, except to say that it, it seems to me to be one of the things one can certainly say about it, one of the most extraordinary apparatus buildings imaginable. That is to say, I've, if I built up this notion of a viewing apparatus as being intrinsic to the modern observation of the city. Uh, beginning clearly with this kind of simulation uh, chamber for city experience, which was the panorama, and going on to you know cruising on the Saturday night, which is uh, which is uh, I in a sense a uh, by means of an apparatus, uh, kinetic and uh, visual and, and and assorted other activities, um, uh, the, the emphasis being on assorted. Uh, a, a way of opening up, of, of dealing with the city, of having it and of, of, uh, of, of, of using it. And, and here is a building which uh, in, its, in its physical form makes absolutely everything within it uh, subject to conditions that mobilize um, every sense that we possess physically. Uh, 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 of connecting where we stand, what we see, where we go, where, what, what, how, we can, how we can connect kinetically and otherwise every part of what we're doing. And it does the same thing at its own total scale to the city itself. It seems both in a sense to sink away in it or to partly rise from it and 
what it makes of the rest of the city is just these shreds. In other words, it makes the most absolute categorical terminal distinction that this, if this building, even as it may look, is going to go down with everything else, the city is already completely finished. It has turned into, into as I said, confetti of text uh, within which signification is so rampant that it can't possibly mean anything. Well, that obviously calls for questions from the audience. Are there uh, questions from the audience? We have mobile microphones who are going to move towards well, lasso, you. Lasso, you know, sort of. Uh, <laughs> nothing from the shock troops of this uh, audience, the Paris Berlin course? Oh, you have a question. I have a question have a, for now. Tony, actually, if I may be the audience for a moment. Um, which, because he'd, he'd forewarned me about the Quintilian passage, about uh, how you can make your uh, memory get stronger by, by uh, if you have to remember a certain sequence, you get a building or a place that you know very well and you attach the first thing you're supposed to remember to the first place and da 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 Have you and tried it? <laughs> not yet, not I, yet. I, I always keep forgetting the plan. Well, <laughs> this, is, this is just exactly what I'm, what I'm going to go at or ask about because um, I knew you would discuss that and so I didn't really try to say anything about that myself except to notice that there's a certain kind of, again, a slippage of a supplementary relation between these two things here. It looks to me like, anyhow, in that on the one hand you have building memory via the stability of the place, but then the achievement through the map that you were talking about, the achievement of the stability of place versus